So the last speaker on our morning session is Dr. Matthew State. I will read all this stuff. Dr. State is a professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry and director of the Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute at UCSF. He's been there a little over two years, a little under two years, um, and he came from a faculty position at Yale where he was co-director of the program on neurogenetics. He's a leading child psychiatrist and internationally recognized expert on the genetics of the, and genomics of autism, Tourette's syndrome, and other neurodevelopmental uh, syndromes. It's a real pleasure to have him here, even though I learned he did both his undergraduate and his medical studies at Stanford. But as you know from previous meetings like this, we're open to this uh, on a limited basis. Uh, but then he did do his residency and fellowship at UCLA before going to Yale and then um, on, to, uh, on to UCSF. He has uh, numerous teaching awards and plays a leadership role in a number of the consortia that you heard about uh, from Megan uh, in the Simon Simplex Collection and the Autism Genome Sequencing uh, Consortium. Uh, he is a member of the Institute of Medicine and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing him talk. He's gonna tell us about the path from genetics to biology and autism spectrum disorders. Thanks. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. So. Um, uh, just um, as, a, as a clinical person, I always start with my disclosures. I serve on several advisory boards. There's nothing in this talk that has any relevance um, to, uh, to anything that would ever make anyone any money. Um, so um, I, I, I am going to focus today on, on, uh, on this, the interface between genomics and, and trying to understand uh, um, uh, how to move forward in, uh, in therapeutics development in autism spectrum disorders. And for those of you who haven't um, uh, thought about it recently, so autism is a, a behavioral syndrome. It's, uh, um, it's defined by an impaired reciprocal social communication and highly restricted interest in repetitive behaviors. There are no, uh, there are no biomarkers. There are no diagnostic tests apart from uh, parental interview and, and, and observation, which is the case for essentially everything that we do in psychiatry. It's been known for a, a, you know, a very long time based on twin studies um, uh, and, uh, and looking at, at, um, at uh, relative risk in families that genes play a major role. Um, with very high MZ concordance um, and much lower DZ concordance. There is, you know, a debate sort of how many um, angels on the head of a pin about exactly what the number is in terms of the heritability. But for, I'm going to talk a bit about sort of the strategy in the lab for someone um, like me who's really interested in genetics primarily as an avenue to understand biology and not as an, you know, kind of an overarching explanatory um, uh, construct, I, it, as long as there's a strong genetic contribution, that's plenty. Um, th the thing that drove actually the genesis of my lab really in quite a concrete way was the absence of effective treatments for the core symptoms, um, which can be tremendously debilitating um, uh, in, uh, in um, autism and, uh, and other neurodevelopmental disorders. Quite literally, I, I um, was a uh, doing my clinical training, I didn't have much of a background in, in basic science. And as a fellow in child psychiatry, was trying to treat kids um, with very severe neurodevelopmental disorders at UCLA um, at about 1997, and, and really thinking about sort of this fundamental problem that the lack of insight into molecular, cellular, and circuit level mechanisms was, was completely limiting in terms of our ability to think about developing treatments at all, and then being quite frustrated with how little, A, we could tell parents about what was going on, and B, offer parents and families and kids um, a real hope of attacking the core problem. And so I went on to do a PhD with Rick Lifton at, at Yale, and then ended up staying there. Um, for 17 years or so. Um, so the overall idea then um, in uh, the, the kind of arc of my career was that, this is, that all of this research I'm going to talk to you about is really um, intensely focused on seeing whether or not there is a path forward. And there actually probably should have been a question mark. Is there a path forward from gene discovery to uh, the developmental novel therapeutics? Certainly, I think there's a path forward to understanding biology. But so the notion here that, and, and the driving motivator is that success in gene discovery is one avenue uh, to begin to gain some traction on these, uh, on these levels of analysis that from, uh, from the physician standpoint seem to be uh, critical to um, progress in medicine in every other area of medicine. And so it seemed uh, um, uh, relatively obvious at, a, at the time, uh, you know, back in the late 90s, um, that it might also offer us um, that, that kind of traction um, in psychiatric disorders. I want to show you a brief video here again for it's I, I love talking to n not completely clinical audiences just to kind of bring you know the gospel of, of focusing on uh, clinical um, uh, 
problems to every audience. So this is a child who's 13 years old who's got autism. Um, and I don't know whether you saw at the beginning, you don't need to worry about the sound. Actually, um, I could turn the sound off and I think you would still get the same kind of picture and, and you don't need to spend any time in clinical training, I think, to get a sense that that is not normal social interaction for a 13-year-old boy. Right at the beginning, you could see some of the um, uh, diagnostic criteria, the um, uh, stereotypic behaviors uh, with hand flapping. And I think the key here, really, that I want you to take away is that this idea about a fundamental impairment in reciprocal social communication that you can really, takes about two minutes, I think, at the start of this video to get a sense that the presence of this child in the room, that's his father on the right and examiner on the left. When you think about normal kind of social interaction, even if someone is social hesitant, it's a very different thing from feeling like the person is really profoundly disconnected socially and, un and being able to understand and then communicate um, uh, in, in that way with these uh, people. Now, uh, the ex um, so you can also see at the end he's, uh, he's pointing to a picture board because he has the absence of language and, and a significant um, uh, um, minority of kids with autism have very profound difficulties in the, and in fact the absence really of, of useful communicative language. So um, I just want to give you sort of the broad overview. I'm not going to you know, do the entire history of autism genetics, but one of the places that I wanted to start is that I think, you know, that it's, I think, widely known that there's been tremendous progress in understanding the genetics of complex disorders, including in psychiatry, including with schizophrenia. And sometimes what I find when I go and I talk about what's been happening in autism is that there's sort of this um, uh, um, kind of uh, instinctive, um, move to think about the contribution of common variation to common disorders because that's been so much the story, you know, GWAS and what do we do about um, alleles of small effect in non-coding regions. And so um, I just want to highlight that that is not the story at all with autism. That I, I, I hope I can convince you um, uh, in the next few slides that there's been tremendous progress in understanding not only the genetic architecture of autism, but specific regions and genes contributing significant risk. But um, so far, GWAS in autism has been essentially completely unrevealing. So um, f we're about 5,000. Actually, there's now a single SNP that's undergoing rigorous kind of evaluation. There's a lot of evidence, you know, from uh, looking at heritability and SNP studies um, that suggests that a good portion of the overall um, uh, population uh, variance is contributed by common um, alleles. But, um, but it's clear that the that heterogeneity, combination of extreme heterogeneity and very, very small effect sizes um, suggests that 5,000 is probably, you know, at least an order of magnitude too low in the sample to make significant progress in terms of identifying specific common variations. So I'm going to tell you a story about the contribution of rare mutations to autism, and that actually really dates back um, in retrospect. It was very hard to get people in the field to believe this, but you know, to the identification of fragile X as a cause for intellectual disability. So the locus was, you know, identified 40 years ago, and and then the cloning of fMRP in 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 the 90s really signaled the first autism gene. It's very clear that there's an elevated rate of social disability apart from intellectual disability in fragile X and in other monogenic um, syndromes. So in fact, there was traction already um, in the idea that studying very rare mutations of high effect might lead to some um, uh, improved understanding of social disability. Um, so that, you know, we, it, it's a very, very poor way to distinguish between the two things I'm going to talk to you about. So we have monogenic syndromes that generally were characterized as a consequence of intellectual dis disability characteristic dysmorphology than gene discovery. So we call those monogenic syndromes. And I'm going to contrast that with quote unquote idiopathic autism, meaning kids who come in with social disability without clear dysmorphology or a known genetic syndrome. The distinction between those two, as you'll see as we move along, um, is kind of um, uh, clearly a fuzzy one at best. But, but it does sort of capture something about the way that we're um, thinking about the problem and also just from a clinical standpoint that you know, we see large numbers of kids, um, the vast majority of kids who come in for assessment in autism um, will, uh, will not have any characteristic dysmorphology. And about half, maybe more than half, will not have intellectual disability as well, um, uh, so-called high-functioning autism. But when we think about that group, the first successes, again, were in rare mutations, um, uh, generally launching from um, 
uh, early studies of cytogenetics, finding rare uh, genetic abnormalities, and then, and then mapping that and, and doing some targeted sequencing around to confirm um, the, the relevance of the, um, of the findings. And really, the first ones were from uh, Thomas Bergeron's lab and Neuroligin-4. It's a, a synaptic adhesion molecule, uh, Norexin-1, which is uh, uh, also an adhesion molecule that actually is a, is a partner for Neuroligin-4 and, and several others. I point out contactin-associated protein-2, um, uh, again, just to sort of get to this last bullet point, that really the success um, very early on was around rare mutations de novo mutations and for contactin associated protein to a rare recessive mutation, right? So it began to give us a picture of what it might look like, but when you add those up, you know, those, you know, each one may, I think, you know, uh, so far less than 1% that it's really hard to estimate what the contribution was collectively. The, after the first two families with the Neuroligin 4X mutations, I think maybe two more have been published over the last 10 years without any other evidence from any genetic studies that um, of, of rare mutations in Neuroligin 4X contributing. Um, so these are very, very rare alleles. And there was still a huge challenge even when we got to this point, and there was a sense that maybe rare mutations would be important, that there really wasn't because of technological limitations a systematic way forward to identify rare um, alleles contributing to common forms of autism. Um, that really changed with, um, with uh, you know, Charles Lee and Mike Wiggler developing um, uh, uh, the, you're leveraging microarray technology to be able to identify copy number variation, uh, submicroscopic chromosomal uh, variations. And uh, so uh, about two years after the first papers describing widespread copy number variation in the human genome, uh, Jonathan Sabot and Mike Wiggler's lab published a paper that showed that if you took actually quite a small number of trios uh, that had autism, uh, only about 100 trios with autism, in which there was um, only a single affected person in the family, so-called simplex autism, and you looked at the rate of de novo copy number variation in those families, that there was a tenfold excess over uh, unaffected families. So, you know, for, for complex geneticists thinking that, you know, sort of the world revolves around samples of 50,000 people, the idea that you would see en masse um, a signal of tenfold excess of a type of mutation um, really, I think, was the, f the most important turning point in beginning to see that this might be a systematic way forward in identifying specific genes. Uh, contributing to autism. So um, at, at about that point, we, um, uh, we had the great fortune of being asked to play a part in, uh, in the Simon Simplex collection. This grew out, actually, of that 2007 paper. Uh, Jim Simons, a, a, a philanthropist in New York, knew Mike Wiggler well. They discussed sort of the importance of these findings and then lamented the fact that there were not samples available, um, uh, widespread samples available to look, particularly for de novo mutation, because most samples at that point were either case control samples in which there was no family data to be able to determine whether the mutation was transmitted or de novo, or they were, you know, um, for, for non-parametric linkage studies in which you had multiple affecteds in the family which conceivably might reduce the signal from de novo mutation. So they decided to build the Simon Simplex collection with the goal of 3,000 extremely carefully um, uh, evaluated families to make sure that they had, you know, the gold standard diagnosis of autism in the kid and that no other first degree relative had um, autism. Uh, so either by family history, but the parents and if there was a SIB had to be assessed using both categorical and continuous measures of uh, autism slash social um, functioning in order to try to get this to look as much as possible like a true simplex uh, cohort to look for de novo mutations. So huge gift to the field for people who want to study de novo mutations because it gives us like the most beautiful simple experiment which is we can not only directly identify de novo mutation by comparing kids to parents, but the, the uh, contribution of having in about 80% of the families an unaffected sibling from the same family allowed us then to um, do all of our experiments within that sample comparing cases to um, matched family-based controls, which helps us kind of completely neutralize the problem of population stratification, which you know, could conceivably play a role in de novo mutation as well as transmitted mutation. So the first um, uh, paper 
uh, was, uh, came out in about 2011 from the Simon Simplex collection. Actually, there were two of them. One was led by my lab and by Stefan Sanders, who's now assistant professor at, at UCSF. Um, and, um, and then a, a parallel effort by Mike Wiggler's lab um, and, and reported initially on about 1,000 of the families. This is um, uh, unpublished data that brings that number up to about 2,100 families where we have good data on copy number variation. And essentially what this is showing, you have probands on the left, siblings on the right, duplications in blue, deletions in red. These are all de novo mutations, and we're looking at the rate of de novo mutations parsed in uh, several different ways. Um, in, in the siblings with autism versus the matched siblings without autism, and essentially just got exactly the same answer that, uh, that Wiggler and Sabat got in 2007, um, and, and continue to do that now. We got it initially in the neuron paper with about 1,000 families, and then with the, um, uh, the, the addition of, of more um, uh, samples now, kind of completing the study, for, uh, at least of Simon Simplex. So there are a variety of interesting observations, but I think the key here is that A, we were able to exactly replicate what they'd done you know, with a sample of 100, now we add a sample of 1,000, now 2,000, which, you know, for psychiatric genetics, I just have to say, having been in the game for 20 years, was literally a hallelujah moment because having any labs replicating each other, you know, for 20 years seemed like almost an impossibility. Um, but we were also able to leverage the larger sample size and a much better understanding of the genomic architecture of de novo mutation in, in unaffected to begin to build a rigorous statistical threshold to say not only is there an overrepresentation in autism versus not, but how many observations do you need to have of a de novo mutation at the same spot in the genome uh, to be confident that you're really seeing an association with disease? And when you think about it, right, the, it, you, there's tremendous statistical power in thinking about that because the genome's a big place, and instead of just having to count, well, there are four in cases and zero in controls, right, it really is a question of how likely are you to see the same section of the genome um, affected by a de novo mutation given the base rate of de novo mutation across the entire genome, and taking into account the fact that that's not obviously evenly distributed, and there's some regions that are much more likely. But we were able to come up with what has really um, uh, gave a very good um, kind of initial estimate that now has been replicated in multiple spots. But, you know, so the exact number for the first paper was the observation of four de novo mutations at a minimum in the same spot in a sample of 1,000 people was um, was using a kind of a frequentist perspective, uh, the, uh, the kind of magic number. We found two regions that exceeded genome-wide uh, significance, one at chromosome 16, um, P11.2, you see that on your right. Um, and that had actually been previously identified by multiple laboratories in the interval between 2007 and 2011, so we were replicating that study. And then a second one that we had identified for the first time associated with idiopathic autism, uh, meaning there, you know, no dysmorphology, et cetera, and kind of gold standard autism diagnosis. On the other side, it's 7Q11.23. And I, I want to focus on that for a second, 7Q11. Remember, so the blue means it's a duplication. So we found that duplications at that segment were strongly associated with autism. So you'll remember, i just give you one second of this video, that, and, and again, just if you kind of imprint the kind of the sense of this kid's social magnet, um, how, how he exists in the room with people that one person he knows and one person that he doesn't. And the reason that I want to show you that is that now what I want to show you is that ex the same region of chromosome 7 that we identified with duplications that were increasing the risk for autism. Uh, there is a, a, a known syndrome um, where uh, precisely the same region uh, is deleted. Can you be born too friendly? I don't mean like a smiling baby. I mean, you can hardly act any other way. Children with no fear of strangers. Meet some kids who I hope fill up your hearts the way they did mine. They're living with a bizarre medical mystery that is a blessing dun, dun. and a curse. It's going to get louder, so bring it down a little bit. Thanks. I thought you could use a little light entertainment in the middle of a genomics seminar, so. So if you would just, can you hear me now? Kids love to ask questions. 
But not as much as these kids. My favorite color is blue. I have that bar in the dinosaur. I live in New York City. Yeah, I have daughters. I do. Well, I have two daughters and a son. And kids love to make friends, but not like these kids. Exactly the same region of the genome, same breakpoints, same genes in the interval. That's the deletion syndrome. The duplication syndrome is actually there's a range of, uh, of abnormalities, but it clearly increases the risk in a very substantial way for autism spectrum disorders. So not only is it just fun to show this, but I think, you know, again, you know, you, you don't need to be um, uh, in any kind of clinical setting to, I think, to sense how profoundly different the social kind of magnet is, the social drive of that second group of kids to what I showed as sort of a, a uh, you know, canonical uh, autism. Um, that's Williams syndrome, and actually it's an extremely reliable behavioral phenotype. More than 90% of kids um, will have tremendous interest in social affiliation. And very interestingly, they have a lot of other psychiatric um, uh, uh, comorbidities. They have very very high rates of anxiety, never social anxiety. And they have intellectual, I mean, we were able to match because they have um, a mild to moderate intellectual disability. So we can match against our autism sample and know that this is not sort of an epiphenomenon of one group being intellectually disabled and the other group not being intellectually disabled. So the reason we love this for, you know, I think for a number, but if you just do the thought experiment, if we were able of those 25 genes to identify what is, is such a profound rheostat in the development of, of circuitry um, subserving social behavior in this way, driving um, that kind of affiliation and interest in social interaction, that would be a profoundly important finding, I think, to move us forward in understanding something about the, the biology of autism. And really, when you think about it, this idea that you could go from genes, you know, genes to biology to treatment is really predicated on an idea that even though there's a tremendous different distance between, you know, a variation in, in the structure of the DNA and complex social behavior, that really this kind of, um, you know, natural experiment, I think, shows shows that there really can be a profound influence of relatively circumscribed genetic changes in terms of, in a pretty reliable way, um, leading to uh, the most kind of complex um, social um, behaviors. And, um, okay, so um, the great experiment. We love doing the CMV study, but still, you know, particularly back then, it's gotten better because of work of your faculty here with CRISPR. But back then, the idea that you would model 25 genes in a region and then combination and permutations of those genes in order to try to get to probably more than one gene in the interval that's conferring um, uh, this. Um, effect um, uh, that, you know, that's a, that's a tough experiment. And the idea, be, as I said, behind the lab is for us to be able really to, to just start the process of understanding biology. And, and our view was the best way to do that is to have, you know, um, a, a coding mutation of a large effect in a single gene that um, our neurobiological colleagues would be able to pursue in depth. And so we weren't able to do that um, in 2011, but by, well, yeah, we were starting to be able to, but we couldn't publish it because we didn't finish till about 2012. But the development of exome sequencing allowed us to do exactly the same experiment that we've done with CMVs, but now at single base resolution across, you know, 70, 80 percent of, of the coding genome. And what we found, not surprisingly, given the, the very strong signal in de novo, copy number variation was a very strong signal in de novo, point mutations to, to the extent that they were loss of function or likely gene disrupting, right? So we didn't do a study on every mutation we found to determine whether it was truly loss of function, but these are stop codons, canonical splice um, uh, mutations, and, um, uh, and frame shifts. So the, the majority of them are likely to have a significant impact on protein function. And there were a variety of papers, you know, again, this sort of this, it, it really represents kind of a major shift in, in, in um, the psychiatric genetics literature is that, you know, now instead of a single lab coming out with a finding that no one replicate, everyone's hitting the finish line at the same time. So there were four papers within, you know, well, three were published in the same issue of Nature, and then one a week later, two weeks later, um, in Neuron, all with exactly the same answer. So essentially exactly the same rate of excess de novo mutation, you know, the 
There's very minor differences that we could argue about till the end of time, but the overall takeaway was exactly the same. Excess rate of de novo loss of function mutations um, in, uh, in kids with autism versus without. And then again, you know, this idea that when you have a type of mutation with a base rate that's so low in the genome, right? so what we're looking at is that across the exome, you get about one de novo um, uh, mutation, missense, or nonsense across the entire exome per generation, right? And so when you have a base rate that that's, is that low, if you have a signal, the signal to noise ratio is really beautiful because there's very little noise. And we were able to leverage that again just to be able to ask the question. Actually, it was much simpler with de novo mutation um, at, at the single base level because we had much better predictions about the underlying rate across the genome of de novo mutation based both on kind of theoretical models um, and, and our empirical data. Data. And so we were able to use relatively small numbers of observations because the chances that you would see even two de novo loss of function mutations in the same gene um, among a sample of this size is actually quite low. And so again, it gives you a lot of power to begin to identify um, genes. And this is a list of the genes that came out of those four papers in which there were multiple de novo loss of function mutations in the genes, at least two. And we went, so CHD8 had, I think at that point, four SCN2A, three, GRIN2B3. Um, so um, uh, it began to give you a list, and certainly the idea that we had traction on, on, uh, on identifying specific genes contributing to autism. And I just want to say again, so that the top line is from uh, work coming from our lab, and it's uh, Stefan, who I introduced you to before, Jeremy Wilsey, who's now a postdoc in the lab, and Sean Dong, who is um, a collaborator from uh, Beta, from Beijing University and uh, Li Pingwei's lab. So um, uh, everyone kept pushing ahead again, exactly same experiment. You know, it's like, it, but uh, turning the crank, you could call it that, but never has turning the crank been so much fun because we finally, after 20 years of wandering in the desert, had a pretty clear path towards accumulating mutations that we had high confidence were related to autism. And so these um, came out in November, I think. Again, um, with everyone kind of reaching the finish line at the same time with expanded samples doing the same experiment in exome. Uh, the first was from Evan Eichler's lab, my lab, and Mike Wiggler's lab is a joint effort. And the second one from 53 labs um, uh, uh, together forming the Autism Sequencing Consortium. And again, so the, our sample was now about 2,700 uh, families from the Simon Simplex collection. And uh, the, um, the ASC, the Autism Sequencing Consortium, looked at, at some of that data plus about 1,500 new trios and came to the same answer that we came to before. Um, replicating the rate of uh, excess and de novo mutation. I think uh, with the expanded sample size, you could begin to see, not surprisingly, that missense mutations, too, started to have some signal, not surprisingly because of the difficulty in distinguishing functional from neutral missense mutations. The effect size is smaller than for, um, for uh, gene-disrupting events. Um, so where does that take us? This is now, if you take all of the data from both studies, um, and put them together. And I should say that the ASC not only had um, de novo mutations, but also used sort of more traditional um, assessment of burden in cases versus controls for um, uh, deleterious mutations and, and, and condensed that into a statistical statement about the false discovery rate um, for uh, uh, genes contributing to autism. And, and we can put them all together and then come up with this list. DNLOF is the number of de novo loss of function mutations. Um, uh, and then as you go across, it's sort of the accumulated data for um, the false discovery rate for, as I said, for each of these genes, with the group on the left being the, you know, obviously the, the, the most reliable, but beginning to suggest, again, that there's a real, you know, now it's a matter of do you have the machines, do you have the patients, can you stick them in, and, um, and then and begin to pull out um, the data on de novo mutation because it's pretty clear that um, we're starting to uh, find highly replicable um, uh, loci including, um, as I said, most of the, most of the genes on, all the way over on the left there. So I, I can linger here. I don't know if there, how many neurobiologists are in the room, but this is often the most exciting slide um, from a funding standpoint, um, if people find their, find their gene on that list. So um, now one of the things I want to say is that, actually, let me go back for a second, is that um, you know, when you look at this, I think the good news is that um, uh, the, the good news is that it, you know, we, we've got a lot of genes. When you start, if you look on, on the lift on, list on the left and just sort of see to the pants, think about what the functions are, it's pretty clear that there isn't you know, a single function here. We've got you know, chromatin modification, 
uh, synaptic proteins, glutamate receptor subunits, uh, sodium channel. Um, basically, we've got every cell compartment and, and, and many cellular functions being represented in this list. And actually, that was the source of some hand wringing as, this, um, as these came out, because the idea, I'm going to tell you in a second, but I'll just jump to it now, is that we could predict based on the rate of de novo mutation we're pulling out of cases um, versus, uh, versus the expected and controls, um, the, the, actually the rate of accumulation of multiple mutations, that the model fits somewhere between 500 and 1,000 targets of de novo mutation contributing to autism, right? So that, that's, a, that's a goodly number of genes. And so there was a hand wringing about, oh my god, not only do we have maybe 500 to 1,000 targets, obviously they won't all carry the same risk, but it's still a big number. But, um, but they're not pointing to, you know, there's not like a simple, this isn't just clearly like synaptic pathology or something like that. And so it's like, oh, are we going to need like a thousand treatments for a thousand different genes? Um, and, and that's a mess. But I would say that even in that, you know, one of the things you can do is just say, well, that, you know, that it certainly is true. But, um, but th this is just without kind of any statistical analysis or anything else, just saying, well, you know, is there anything that looks like it's popping out? And these are all genes that are involved in chromatin uh, remodeling or chromatin modification. And so, you know, we've got a balance here that on the one hand, there's high diversity uh, and a lot of heterogeneity. At the same time, we see, we do see enrichment using just kind of basic um, uh, uh, categorizations or gene ontologies. So we see enrichment for chromatin modification for synaptic pro um, uh, proteins. Um, we see very, very strong enrichments for targets of fragile X mental retardation protein. Again, sort of validating the notion that we had an autism gene 40 years ago and had no idea what to do with it. Um, and uh, and um, then there's also a preponderance towards uh, embryonic genes. Um, interestingly, particularly given the history of psychiatry in which for many decades we blame mothers for autism, saying for the psychoanalytic model was that it was refrigerator mothers. For this portion of autism risk, which we think probably accounts for about 20% of kids in the clinic. Um, the vast majority of mutations are coming from fathers, um, and, uh, and particularly from in, um, fathers uh, uh, as they age, because there's an increased rate of genova mutation with paternal age. Told you 400 to 1,000 genes. Interestingly, you know, from, uh, from the standpoint of, uh, of being a, a clinician, that um, for a very long time there was a very strong feeling like you had to find, in order for something to be relevant biologically, it had to be specific for our psychiatric diagnostic categories, which, in, you know, is a pretty crazy idea given how bad those categories are, right? We just ask people questions about, you know, how do you feel about this and what did your child do when they were three years old and then we have you know come up with these categories but there was still that expectation and if there was any remnant of that as we discovered these genes it became clear that that was you know kind of a fool's errand because not only did these mutations um, contribute to autism particularly with the CNVs it's absolutely clear that they also contribute very often exactly the same copy number variation contributes to pretty much the entire range of what we would call neurodevelopmental disorders, schizophrenia, intellectual disability, epilepsy, um, autism, um, and probably attentional problems like ADHD. And we begin to see the same thing now with de novo mutations to the extent that we can compare groups. We see overlap with schizophrenia risk. We see overlap with, uh, with epilepsy. I guess I have to pause here just because, you know, as, as over the last year or two, I find that I kind of run through gene discovery. It's like, yeah, we did this, we did that and stuff. And I, it just is, it's always a moment when I, that um, it really is a remarkable difference. I mean, you know, even starting in 97 when the tools started to get better, it, it wasn't, you know, for 15 years we found nothing or almost nothing in the lab, right? Everything that we thought was there would, either would disappear or almost disappear, one or two findings over that period of time. And the shift from that to, you know, to people, you know, coming, uh, I have young folks in the lab will come up and say, oh, we got another autism gene we're headed out to lunch, right? I mean, it's changed so much, but, but that it's, it's a wonderful thing um, and presents, I think, extraordinary opportunities, right? So we have what I hoped when I started the lab we might be able to find. We have coding mutations. We have single mutations that are carrying large risks. If you remember the table with a false discovery rate of less than um, a 0.01, we can you know, sort of estimate what the overall effect size is for that group, and it, it's a, it looks like a collectively about a 20 fold increase in risk for autism spectrum disorders having the mutation versus not. 
Right? I mean, that for us in psychiatric genetics, that's a very big bang. So we've got those who've got large effects, uh, particularly for that set of genes. It trails down to where you know, we, we get much closer to common variation with some of the other ones. But there's clearly a subset with very strong risk. Um, and we have now a path towards systematic gene discovery. And even if we can't explain all of the population risk, we are explaining now, it looks like probably when we get, you know, if we can get funding to do more and more sequencing, that, that it's a pretty safe prediction that at least 20% of kids that we see coming into clinic with no other kind of evidence of a genetic syndrome will have either de novo copy number variation, a transmitted variation in a region that we discovered by de novo uh, dis discovery, um, or a point mutation um, uh, identified in this way. But it's not that we don't have like very, very big challenges. And again, I said that the, you know, we're quite different than other areas in, in psychiatry. You know, the sort of initial question that we always get is, well, what about genotype phenotype correlations? Did you look to see whether or not there was anything distinctive about people with you know, a CHD8 mutation or an SCN2A mutation? And I always have to remind them, we had one of those in 2,000 people. You know, we had four of them in a total sample of about 8,000 people. So there's no statistical power to do things that other people can do in complex genetics when they have a common variant. They can do imaging genomics much more easily. They can do genotype phenotype much more easily. So we struggle a bit with that. We obviously have very high heterogeneity. We, there's tremendous pleiotropy in the genes that we know are contributing to autism. We, we certainly had a hint of this through monogenic syndromes because we've got fragile X, but then you know, there, there's actually quite a bit of convergence in monogenic syndromes around mTOR pathway. So you know, basically, you're in all of biology. You're either in all of synaptic biology. You're in all of you know, protein synthesis in, 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 uh, in thinking about what the, um, where the clues are leading you. So we've got definite pleiotropy of the risk genes. It's very hard to say this is exactly what the gene is doing, and so that must be where the pathology is. Um, and then we have like the, the, always the age-old problem in psychiatry is we never have access to the tissue, right? We, we can't go to brain and ask the question, what is, what is this mutation doing in a, human, in a human's brain? And, and so we're, you know, we use model systems like everybody else, but it's a particular challenge because of the anatomical um, and cellular diversity and just complexity, not only of adult human functioning brain, but of developing brain. So we know from a whole variety of work, including by the good um, Dr. Geshwin, who we'll talk to you later today, that, um, that the, you know, there's tremendous dynamism um, in gene expression, the underlying um, uh, uh, genetic biology of, of human brain development and function. So that poses you know, kind of a, a major challenge. And, and I'm going to spend the very end just kind of taking you through sort of some of the early ideas we had in the lab about how, how in the world we were going to get from gene discovery to biology to some kind of updated notions. So this was sort of the, the slide that I showed for 15 years before I was able to find anything, which was we'll find a gene, we'll figure out its function, we'll put it in a model system, we'll understand the pathway, um, and, and then uh, we will find a treatment. And so what we found is, yes, we could find a gene, but they're 400 to 1,000. Uh, when we begin to look at expression and function, uh, it's um, you know, highly dynamic across development, across brain development. Um, we have model systems that may be good in some ways, uh, certainly are good in some ways for biology, but have obvious limitations when you're thinking about a psychiatric disorder that involves reciprocal social communication and language. Um, and then the, the idea that we would land on a single pathway that we would be able um, to, to dissect as a way of understanding what a treatment might be, you know, increasingly the, the complexity of that began to dawn on us in, in the lab. And then I realized, so a lot of this came from, I, I told you at the start, I did my PhD with Rick Lifton, who does hypertension and thinks about the kidney. And I realized one day when I was looking at this, is like, wow, this is what a nephrologist would put up. It is not what a child psychiatrist should put up, because there's nothing about development there, right? So this is a static picture. Uh, that presumes that wherever you find the gene and where you study its function is going to lead you to a pathway that somehow is continuously relevant. And we've got a neurodevelopmental disorder that has onset in, typically in the first six months of life. So um, development is going to be an issue. So we began to think about that. Um, 
One thing I should say is that I don't want to, you know, sort of disregard that kind of, you know, find the gene, hammer, a, you know, a high, highly penetrant mutation, because in fact, it's going on around the country right now, and very interesting things are coming out, whether it's, you know, Dan's work on contactin-associated protein 2, or Mark Baer's work on uh, Fragile X, or, you know, just you go down the list, Uta Zogby's work on MECP2. There's no question that that's leading to a much deeper understanding of the biology of the genes that we know are contributing to autism, but it still raises, a, 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 when you look at them individually, I think it's hard not to see these kind of parallel lines of work and say, wow, you know, the biology is so diverse. How in the world do you know what aspect of the biology that you're uncovering is really related to the thing that I care about, which is where's the risk, where's the risk for autism reside? Right? And, and there, it, that may be the same answer to where the risk to schizophrenia resides in some cases, but maybe not necessarily. But it's clear that answering the question, what do these genes do, is not the same thing as answering the question, is there traction on, on um, pathophysiology, um, real traction in terms of thinking about therapeutics development. So I think and, you know, a, a pretty kind of straightforward way to think about it, I think which everyone, a bunch of labs started to think about right away is, well, maybe if we, if we think about the genes collectively instead of thinking about parallel experiments and we think about the convergence of these genes just the way we did in kind of an offhand way of saying, can we interpret this by not asking what does each one do, but asking is there a signal within all of this noise? And so there's the kind of initial push on systems biology was sort of to do that either through protein-protein interaction or through um, you know, understand, looking at, at, um, uh, at gene ontologies. And this is a, a, um, a Brian O'Rourke, who at the time was in Evan Eichler's lab, but I have to take some credit because he was a graduate student in mine and you know, the formative years when he learned how to do science. Um, so um, uh, he, their paper was very interested in trying to move towards sort of a systems biological understanding. And, and this is a great diagram for a couple reasons. One is that, I mean, I think it shows sort of the state of the art of the field is that you, you know, they're using a known protein-protein interaction databases and they give you a nice picture. And from that picture, looking all of these mutations, they can tell you that chromatin modification, this was very early before, you know, we had 60 genes there were only nine, and so um, you know maybe you would have bet on chromatin modification. But just from those initial nine genes, they were able to say, look, chromatin modification looks like it's important. So so there's some clear value to this. But from our laboratory standpoint, these were also very frustrating experiments because what we wanted to know is like, what do you do next? And so when you look at that, you say, well, chromatin modification is relevant for these genes. I have no idea really what to do with that. Again, so I think I have time for one anecdote. I, this was really driven home because we, our lab has identified SCN2A sodium channel. And with a highly penetrant mutation now replicated many times, or multiple times, maybe not many. And, um, and uh, you know, we had the gene, we had it, you know, a couple years before publication, ran down the hall of Steve Waxman's lab. Steve is like the sodium channel person, every reagent you would possibly need in order to model this. And we're like, How, we've got an autism gene, we know we've got it, let's work together. And, and he looks so decidedly uninterested, you know, like just uh, it's completely deflated in the room as was my, um, postdoc um, and and Steve because and Steve said yeah it's like calm down hot shot and and he says you know look this is great but I, I'm not even going to get in the game unless you can tell me what cell type to model this in at what point in development if you can't tell me that what I can guarantee you is if I put this mutation in one cell at one point in time I'm going to get something if I put it in another cell I put it in a Purkinje cell it's going to be different from you know a glutamatergic neuron if I do it very early in development it's going to be different than if I do it in mid fetal or later so so come back to me when you have an idea when and where I, I should look at these genes. And so that set us on a path um, to try to see whether or not there was some traction using system biology ideas in order to gain traction, not just on what the genes were doing, like through protein-protein interaction, but to really try to capture something about spatial and temporal variables. Um, in brain development, and the only way, you know, that the, there was obviously a line of work, again, you know, I'm gonna, every time I mention Dan, but he, he was really um, the, a pioneer in, in this area, is that we were starting to see that there was an ability to have an unbiased data set that gave you some traction on time and space. Right? So most protein-protein interaction databases are sort of this accumulated mass of knowledge that don't allow you to parse in that way. But the maps of gene expression in developing human brain 
Dan had started that, Nanad Sestin and, and at Yale was just down the hall from me, had started really a major effort to try to get a map of multiple brain regions at multiple time points. So we could begin to think about using that to, to uh, look for points of convergence in, uh, in autism. So this is Jeremy Wilsey, now the postdoc in the lab, led this um, uh, effort um, in collaboration with Nanad and several other people. Nanad had started something, or had, was contributing to uh, the brain Span initiative was a, a major kind of uh, force in that effort, which again was just taking a human brain, taking 15 time points, 15 different dissected regions, running initially microarray and then um, uh, um, uh, RNA-seq in order to get data on uh, what is uh, the expression pattern uh, of, of these genes look like in, across those variables. And then we took our highest confidence autism genes as the start of a seed-based approach at looking at co-expression. So we thought, we'll take each one of the genes that we have very high confidence is contributing to autism. We'll look to see what a very tight co-expression network looks like around those individual genes to begin to see whether or not that starts to point to some kind of functional convergence. And this is sort of the overall layout of the experiment. As I said, we started with the genes and then with this um, um, map of gene expression, uh, a gross one, but still one that begins to capture the variables that we're interested in. We created a windowed analysis in which we looked at co-expression networks around our seed genes um, for each period at, um, in each brain region and collected all of those. And then we had to figure out, so how do we know, you know, now we've got all these co-expression networks, which ones are important, how do you get there? So we had the idea that we had this other data set, the genes that fell just short of statistical significance from our studies, but they, those would be, they would have an increased probability of being autism genes. And so we could ask the question, is there some point in time when any of these networks that are defined by the highest confidence genes start to reveal um, the additional genes that, that we, you know, are, are just below threshold. So we look for enrichment of what we call probable ASD genes at the time to see whether we could narrow in on a time frame um, and, um, uh, and uh, period. And I think I have these reversed, or actually I lost a slide. So what I'm going to have to do is just cut to the chase, which is surprisingly, when we look to see whether there was enrichment for these probable autism genes in any of the networks at any of the time points, we, we got a pretty narrow answer. So we found that mid-fetal development in, in prefrontal cortex was a point in time in which we had um, uh, greater connectivity in the networks than we expected and this enrichment in probable ASD genes. And once we knew that that network was enriched, we could begin to ask questions about the properties of that network to say, does it correspond to any particular cell type? Does it correspond to any particular layer in human brain? And we got the answer that for us, there were cortical glutamatergic neurons. They were not astrocytes, not oligodendrocytes, not microglia, and they were in lower layer cortex, not upper layer cortex. Um, so we, again, this is, you know, the new, the, the new reality is that everyone was moving at the same time. In fact, uh, Dan, Dan's lab and my lab published in the same issue. And, and this is a little bit hard to suss out, but what you're looking at is regions of the brain on the vertical axis, periods of development on the horizontal axis, and then kind of a rough map of similar studies all asking the question, is there a convergence of autism genes at any place or time in human brain? So our lab is the first box B. Um, or actually it's the second box. The first one is sort of the prior view of systems biology that didn't capture spatial and temporal variables. And then so our kind of bottom-up analysis gave us that section corresponds to mid-fetal development and we have some in, in prefrontal cortex and a little bit of a signal in striatum. Dan's lab is next. They had a signal at the essentially overlapping period of mid-fetal development and then another signal a bit later on. I have to say we used both different methodology and somewhat different gene lists in doing this. Dan also, I should say, found that their enrichment was most pronounced in upper layer uh, in uh, uh, cortical glutamatergic neurons. Ours was in lower, and that's going to be an interesting thing to sort out. And then there was another paper, again, that got almost the identical answer using a different method, just asking the question, where is there the most specificity to the expression, uh, brain specificity, the expression of genes contributing to autism? And this is actually from uh, um, Joe Doherty's lab, who was uh, formerly, I guess, a postdoc or a student in, in Dan's lab. 
So I think that there's some traction there. I think it's, it's striking that if you ask the question, can you begin to use this kind of approach um, to lay out when and where in and, and development you might want to target um, your next experiment, which is all we were trying to do. We said, well, now we have a mutation. So actually, I could go back, because SCN2A is in that network, and I can go back and say, Steve, I could be wrong, but I have a really good idea that it's cortical glutamatergic neurons, and you should look in deep layer, but just in case, Dan got it and we didn't, you should look in upper layer as well. And then you really ought to take a look um, uh, at mid-fetal um, and, and, and you know, in, uh, in, in cortical regions. And then I think an even more important point is to say this is really the start of a set of experiments where you can say, well, we have a strong hypothesis that the genes that contribute to this network, because it's a subset of all the autism genes, that there may be a convergent functional phenotype, which would be the most important thing, right? Because now if we said, well, what happens in a cortical glutamatergic neuron when you mess with chromatin modification or a sodium channel or a synaptic um, uh, adhesion molecule, it may be that we would begin to see, say at a circuit level, that you see similar disruptions at that particular point in time in that particular cell type where multiple paths, you know, there are multiple roads to Rome coming together in a functional way. And I, and I do think that it, as a complement to the kinds of experiments we're seeing with individual animal models kind of, you know, powering through um, uh, uh, big mutations, that thinking about whether or not we can constrain the experiments in this way to begin to look for functional convergence um, is, uh, is, is a, a potentially a powerful approach. So there's, I hope I've um, given you sufficient data to suggest that there's really been a sea change in psychiatric genetics in general, but in autism um, uh, particularly. Um, and we have a, 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 about 20 genes with an FDR of, of less than 0 0.01, so with a very high likelihood of being autism genes. And another set right behind them, again, where the only you know, kind of limiting factor now is the ability to get them into sequencers. Um, we see chromatin modification, synaptic transmission. I, I didn't make the point in this talk, but it really does look like CHD8, one of the chromatin modifiers, really is a, is a profoundly important hub um, for uh, autism pathology um, for, um, in part, again, I should have had this somewhere in the talk, but the slide disappeared. Um, because of the, w when we began to look at um, uh, these co-expression networks, we can see that CHD8 is a primary driver of the, of, um, uh, the expression um, co-regulation um, uh, in, uh, in our most important modules or most important networks. I think there are multiple paths to the translation of these findings into biology. I think we're a step away from understanding how tractable that is, how actionable it is, but we're so much closer than we have been ever. Um, and I do believe that regardless of whether we get it this year or next year, that with the advent of a whole variety of technologies from um, you know, what we're doing now with whole genome sequencing, which I think is only probably a small part of it, but, but more with genome editing, um, being able to understand brain function at circuit level with optogenetics and, and, um, and other similar technologies that were this really is the very first stages, I think, of a major revolution uh, in a way that you know, I really could only you know, hope for, dream about when, when this started back in about 97, that understanding something about the molecular, cellular, and circuit level pathology um, may really give us a new way of thinking about uh, childhood psychiatric disorders, both diagnosis and treatment. So thank you very much for your attention. I just want to say quickly, this is the collaborative group um, uh, that um, did um, a, a lot of the systems biology work led um, by uh, Nanad Sestin with the uh, help of Jim Noonan, who is a esteemed, uh, um, I guess, graduate of uh, uh, the Rubin Lab here or postdoc in the Rubin Lab here. Um, Bernie Devlin and Catherine Rader, statisticians in, in Pittsburgh, who helped us think about creating the statistical framework for this. And then Antonio Geraldes, who's been working with us uh, to try to use zebrafish to also leverage the idea that we may be able to. Um, to use that kind of um, uh, high th or medium throughput model system to think about this question of convergence. And then um, uh, particularly, I just want to point out the, all the families, 3,000 families that participated in the Simons Foundation Autism Research Initiative, without whom we would have empty slides. So um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm stunned by the fact that you're, you're saying, if I interpret it, there's like more than a thousand loci in the human genome that are haploinsufficient for what's not a terribly subtle phenotype. I mean, these are pretty profound effects. 
My impression is that wouldn't be true of metabolic variation or morphological variation. I mean, you're seeing all these dominant loss of function effects. I'm wondering if, if you have any thoughts about what that says about the, the genetic programming of human brain development as opposed to other aspects of our... So, so I think there are a couple things to say. One is that you know it's one of the first that you know it's like a really surprising result for us because you would think that there would be you know tremendous redundancy in these kinds of systems, and so you you wouldn't see that kind of genetic architecture. I think that there are a couple things to point out. One is that I, I, it's really important point that there's a tremendous distribution in the effect here, right? And so I, my guess is that what we're going to see is that as we sequence more and more, that you know these first hits, it's already started to be that way with copy number variation, that the first big ones that we found really outpace everything else that we discovered for the next five years, so that you end up seeing that there are a relatively small number that have very large effects, and then a tail of the distribution that looks much more like common variation in the human genome. The second thing that I would say is that while it is true that kind of the you know, canonical autism is a very profound phenotype, again, as you get into more subtle versions of social disability, you start to run into not only normal, but actually adaptive behavior, right? And so there are lots of stories about who, what famous and incredibly rich people are on the spectrum, but it's probably not all apocryphal that, that some of this. So I think that that plays out. And then empirically, one of the things that always interested us, so we started in the lab thinking that we could use recessive inheritance in rare families uh, in order to find, uh, you know, homozygous loss of function mutations in families in Turkey and Egypt, et cetera, um, with autism. And what we found is that when we identify families with significant morphological changes, um, uh, significant intellectual disability and autism, we, we, gene discovery was a relative breeze. We would find homozygous loss of function mutations easily. When we started to look at families that didn't have those other things and just had autism, the yield was like zero. Chris Walsh had the same experience. Hundreds of families without that kind of very penetrant homozygous loss. So I think it suggests that part of the phenotype is really violates the first assumption, which is, you know, this is a really profound, you know, debilitating phenotype, uh, you know, across the board. So our hypothesis is that probably the autism were homozygous missense mutations or something like that, less severe, but we had no way of identifying because the only signal we could really see was, the lo was homozygous loss of function. Other question? How about the ever increasing frequency of children born with ASD. Right. How do that uh, fit into the picture? Right. So the question is, oh yeah, you, you've got the, the mic. So, so the first thing is, is that you know, it's, it's very hard to get a beat on exactly how much the prevalence of autism has increased, truly increased. And partly that's because of how bad we are at diagnosis. And, and so it, you know, all of the comparisons to years ago are apples and oranges because the diagnostic criteria have changed completely in the last 40 years. And it leads to a very, very high estimate of increase. So, and it's not terribly easy you know, even to say, well, let's use modern methods and do the study you know, now 10 years apart. We do see some increase. I think that there's a general feeling among epidemiologists that are very good and, and really thinking about this, that the increase may be on the order of a two, three, or four-fold increase, not a hundred-fold increase that's in the popular kind of press. But that's still pretty impressive. And what I can say is that with regard to just de novo mutation, we can account for a tiny proportion of that by knowing that de novo mutation point mutation increases with paternal age, secular trend towards older fathers is going to modestly increase. I think you know, what it points to, though, is the way in which understanding a genetic mechanism might lead us to get a better understanding of environmental contributors, right? Because uh, anything else that would increase the rate of de novo mutation would, would have, have an impact on the overall prevalence of autism. And then what I always add when people ask this question is that there's so much that we don't know about this. And I would say the one thing that we feel pretty awfully confident about is that at a population level, vaccines have nothing to do with either a, a, a small or large purported increase in the prevalence of autism. There is a tremendous opportunity here. My name is Pelionis, and you may know my fractal mathematical approach to recursive genome function. And uh, this is what I mean. You refer to copy number variations and also to Jim Simons. 
And uh, for those of you who may not know Jim Simons, he's a mathematician uh, who made billions on stock market analysis by algorithms, who happens to have autism in the family. Obviously, this field needs an enormous amount of money. Yes. Now, when we talk about copy number variations, a problem for Jim Simons may be that a copy is not defined. Is it 1,000 BP, or is it 5,000 BP, or 10,000, or maybe half a million BP? So he doesn't know. But if we say what the genome is, it's full of repeats, then it's a fractal. Then he instantly understands, because he's a mathematician. So we can really improve the momentum of this field by connecting two vastly different fields of psychiatry and mathematics. And yeah, not surprisingly, Jim's ahead of you on this. So Jim has just, he's invested an enormous amount of money um, in thinking about it in this way, because that's where he naturally goes. So he invested in the genome piece of this in order to start this process. And now, I, I don't know how many people he's brought in, uh, um, 30, a group already of 30 new computational, you know, people that range from mathematics to information technology to be an in-house analytic group. He's reached out to a number of his friends in the mathematics community to, to think about doing analysis on this work. Um, so he's there, but, but I do think that there, that, um, you know, just like, so I have to say, Jim and his contribution really profoundly changed the field. The major investment from NIH um, at this point was in case control studies and thinking about common variation. Even the rare variation stuff was case control. And if you look retrospectively, nothing came out of it. And Jim just made the investment to the tune of tens of millions of dollars to get to this stage and is prepared, I think, to do that now moving forward. And, and I, he has made a bit of a contribution to Berkeley, right, and recently in terms of uh, um, um, computational mathematical. So I, I do think that there are real opportunities that he already sees, but is, I think, where he thinks the field is headed right now. Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask if you observe the mosaicism within the individuals for the SNVs and the novel mutations. Is it possible that some of his, uh, the novel mutations and SNVs are lineage, lineage specific? Yes. So it's a great question, and yes, I mean, you know, so the lim this is uh, obviously a first cut, um, and we're using sort of the most reliable technology that we could kind of early on. And so we actually, we put pretty high thresholds to detect de novo mutation, so almost, you know, by design blinded ourselves um, to evidence of mosaicism in the families. But you can see even early on, the earliest copy number variation findings um, actually came from multiplex families in which there was clear germline mosaicism in the family that led to multiple kids with both apparent de novo mutation. Chris Walsh has been working on this um, uh, um, at, kind of at, at multiple levels, but I think it's undoubtedly the case that we're missing a signal from, um, uh, from uh, a mosaicism, potentially from, um, you know, um, from germline mosaicism and from somatic mutation. Um, so it's, I, I think it's a great question and very likely that that might provide traction on thinking about um, uh, lineage specificity in early development. Yeah, so if I got correctly, you said there's about a thousand loci and many of them correlate with other neurological disorders or So can you expand that a little bit? I mean, what about, do they correlate with immun immunological disorders? I mean, what's the specificity for neuro, neuro Yeah. So right now, um, the, um, the, the, the answer goes both ways. So um, uh, I, I've seen analyses both of common variation schizophrenia and of rare variation in autism asking uh, th that kind of question. Um, there's a strong overrepresentation of neurological disorders when you look for overlap and enrichment in the rare variants. Um, we don't see through gene ontology or other kinds of analysis a direct, very strong signal yet for immunological function that would suggest an overlap. 
The flip side is, is though that um, both work from gene expression studies um, and from very large scale um, uh, analysis of EMR records, Zach Cohane's work uh, um, in Boston suggests that there's very likely to be a true overlap in terms of a subset of kids with immunological dysfunction and autism. So in the EMR record is a, um, a, a subset of kids with a, a dramatic increase in, in uh, evidence of immunological disease based on you know, um, uh, essentially an unbiased data set and, and clinical diagnoses. And then from Dan's work, are you gonna talk about any? So Dan initially did, ha, has done some work that suggested that some of the modules that are identified um, in, a, in a comparison of, of developed brains um, uh, in autism versus controls um, uh, reveals a signal for immunological function uh, contributing. Um, and the question about sort of is that primary or secondary, what effect does it have on courses um, is, remains open one. So I think that I, I may have answered a different question than you're asking. So if the question is, does it look like this is just kind of random noise that you just find a thousand genes and so they're doing everything, neither for the common loci in autism or for the rare variant, um, uh, common variant, in schizophrenia or rare variants in autism, is there any, we don't see overrepresentation of risk for diabetes. We do see some from congenital heart disease, which I think would likely be expected. We don't see for immunological disorders with regard to the genes, so. One right. quickly, is, is, there, yeah. is, is, is there any that is specific to autism that, that doesn't show up in schizophrenia that's very, of, of your strong possibly effects? Great question, we don't know yet. So I think you know that there's um, there's a very strong um, there's we're looking under the lamp post and these are the earliest findings and so I think there are a lot of questions about as this process gets more mature what will come out I think it's clear that the way that we're doing this is enriching for things like intellectual disability because when we turn it on its head we can say well we can increase the yield of de novo mutation um, by looking at kids with IQ under 100, et cetera, that that leads then to the question of what's the genetic architecture and what's contributing at IQs over 100? Might that be more specific for social disability? And then the third question about how that sort of matches up with schizophrenia is, is hard to know. I'd say that, that my guess just when we first did the CMVs, it was like every CMV we found, a week later someone had found that in schizophrenia. And, and so far we've done, you know, like however many thousand autism families. And the schizophrenia group is now at 2,000 or 3,000 trios. A lot of that unpublished. The, the Venn diagram has much less overlap with regard to these point mutations. So my guess is, is that we, we may in fact begin to find um, uh, genetic contributors that are, are a bit more specific. How specific would be hard to, hard to know until we get there. Uh, so knowing that defects in genes are, um, are occurring like mid-development, um, mid-fetal development, what kind of treatments are you thinking would be actually yeah. uh, tractable and useful? So, you know, again, there's a lot of hand-wringing about the finding of, of mid-fetal development. Um, and, uh, you know, because uh, obviously, one, it's hard to get traction on that even in a model system, let alone getting traction on that with regard to therapeutics. I think the first thing to say is that just because there's a point of convergence there, um, you know, so it, it, do the thought experiments, that that point of convergence um, disrupts early uh, circuit formation. That is a point in time when very early um, uh, cortical fugal fibers are first having synaptic connections. So maybe you mess that up and it sets up, you know, some subtle disruption in, in sort of the, um, the functioning of that circuit. What we hope is that while some of that may be truly developmental in the sense that that has to happen at that point in time, that the deficits may in fact be ongoing and more quote unquote functional, right? So we see, for instance, in Fragile X syndrome that, and, and actually for many, it's a good time to be a mouse. In many monogenic disorders, you can see that for intellectual disability syndrome genes that there is still a real possibility of rescue, you know, even into adulthood for almost all the genes that we've identified. Right, so Fragile X, you can, at least in a mouse model, rescue you know, MECP2, TSC1, et cetera. So our hope is that while this may help us begin to understand what that convergent phenotype might look like, that 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is in a critical period in which you will have no traction. Is it possible that it's an irreversible developmental deficit? You'd ha certainly it's possible, but we, we hope that that's not the case. And I, and I don't think that our findings really suggest strongly one way or the other. What they do suggest is that whatever's being set up, that there's a convergent point of vulnerability for multiple functions at around mid-fetal development, and particularly in the cortex. Over here. I, I, I have a question about the two other technologies. Um, is there any window of opportunity using uh, cerebral spinal fluid proteomics and imaging to help you locate where in the brain the problem is? It's, it's a great question. I, I'd say the answer is yes. CSF, I, I think, is it, for a whole variety of reasons. We, they're, they're, uh, it, it will take me on a tangent, but so the short answer is yes. Very hard to get IRB approval to do uh, spinal um, taps in kids with autism who don't have something else going on. Uh, it's inhibited looking at CSF, which I think is really too bad because I think that, you know, it, at least it gets us closer and I think would give us some opportunity, particularly if there's a subset already that we're beginning to see where there may be ongoing immune dysfunction, that being able to think about um, uh, CNS autoimmunity or, or immunity um, uh, playing a role could be really powerful. Um, we have a group of kids that have something called childhood disintegrative disorder. We've been studying them for 15 years. Profound um, uh, deficits that emerge after a, a prolonged period of normal development up to three or four years of age. Horrible, and they come out looking just classically autistic. We've done, you know, we thought, oh, well, that's, you know, it's very likely that that has some monogenic, you know, sort of RET-like. We, we have done every genetic technology that we can possibly think of in that disorder and find absolutely nothing. And I think that you know, when you begin to look at it and think about whether or not there may, you know, that may be, um, in fact, it's coming on at four years of age because you've got you know, some kind of encephalopathy that is you know, immune related, um, may be a model for some of what we're seeing in more typical autism, but we just we, we haven't gotten there yet. And imaging, there's a lot of imaging going on. I think there's, there's a real hope both that um, as we understand something about the genes that at least gets us to circuits, we can go in the neuroimaging and understand something about sort of global signals and then move down. Finally, I mean, you know, whatever, I'm just going to ramble on. But I really think, you know, ECOG arrays in kids with autism and epilepsy could be a really exciting um, set of experiments to do to sort of increase the resolution to bridge the gap between where we are and where our imaging colleagues are. Two questions. Okay, I Don't let Dan ask a question. I was just wondering about uh, subsets of the autism patients, and in particular, if there's genetic differences between the children who had mild or severe autism in terms of their like excess variant burden? Yeah, so um, the, the answer is yes and no. So there is a definite, um, uh, th th it looks like there's a very strong signal for a different genetic architecture for kids with autism that have a high IQ versus low IQ. That in fact is not the same thing as severity. So there's a correlation between the, se the, the severity of social disability and IQ, but it's not an identity. So we can see kids with very high IQ who are very seriously socially disabled, um, and, and we can see kids with low IQ who are not very seriously socially disabled. But there's absolutely a difference. It looks like you know, the, 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 the vast majority of signal for de novo mutations are, is an IQ below 100. Not all of it, but, but you can see a really dramatic increase for de novo loss of function variants when you go to kids where there's also intellectual disability. And I think people feel that the common variation that we've had trouble getting a handle on, you know, would, you know, it would be obvious that there would be more of a common variant signal in higher functioning autism. Let's end with Dan. I have no idea. Okay. Um, just wanted to make one comment about the uh, developmental uh, treatment issue. Uh, one example in humans is epilepsy, where a lot of epilepsy is due to fetal developmental migrational problems or things like that. And uh, it's either treatable surgically or with medications in an adult. And so there there are a half dozen mouse models of these developmental disorders that are treated in adults. So the hope is that there'll be some treatment windows where you can modulate brain function even though there's a developmental disorder down the road. What he said. I, <clears throat> the question I had is more, uh, you know, kind of theoretical at this point, and I, and I would love to hear your um, thoughts on this, because it's, um, so we have these, you know, uh, one of the questions is, gets this issue of the 
relationship of de novo, kind of large effect variance with more intellectual disability, the IQ, and the statement that, you know, but that doesn't mean social dysfunction. Social dysfunction is kind of a separable component in a way, although uh, a obviously question. if you put an ice pick in the brain, you can affect social cognition. Right. But, but there's a component of it that's totally separate. So then the notion is, um, then you have these large, uh, not large, multiplex families or parents, uh, which are different than the Simons kind of family, um, where there's a kind of broader phenotype of social dysfunction, say in the parents or in the sibling, maybe some ADHD floating around and other things. And so do you think that you know, some of that may just be due to rare variation that's not on a continuum with the normal variation that might modulate our general social behavior in the population. So do you think it's a separate mode? Or do you think that a There's good a portion of that of is gonna be, is gonna be uh, you know, on a continuous form of you know, probably common variation? Um, yeah. So I, I, you know, I, this is gonna sound like a cop out, but my, you know, I, I think it's a great question. And, um, and my gut is that it will be both. You know, so I think you know when you look at what we're able to divine by just looking, you know, at the GWAS signal and saying, well, we don't, we can't find a single gene, but can we see a signal, you know, in in um, across at least case control samples from common variation? The answer is yes, and I think that you know it. it my guess is that that's going to distribute like a quantitative trade and be across the entire population, and that you may have an accumulation of multiple small effect alleles that are playing a role in dictating the course in, in some of these multiplex families. But I also think there's already data from Steve Scher or other people who are you know really trying to trace these things, Thomas Bergeron, where they're seeing in these families like it's a really complicated kind of you know lexicon of rare mutations, but you see like a whole bunch of stuff that you know has the feel of being related, um, but it's just so hard to parse out you know to prove it right now. I do think that the the combination of sort of the easier part of this is going to be either very big common variant studies or continuing to do the kind of stuff we're doing now. The most interesting stuff I think may start to clarify as we begin to have kind of a reservoir of common variants and begin to better understand the contribution of the lower effect rare variants that we might find by the current methods. Does that, yeah, that's my guess. This is, a, this is great. Thank you all to all Thank the speakers. Thank you so much, appreciate your attention. Yeah.